The following is an audio adaptation of Jeremy Bove's The Protagonist Theory, revised edition, a video essay, read for you by Microsoft Ava. A version read by the author himself will be available on the YouTube channel in the relatively near future, although, as of this video's creation, one does not yet exist. The following is extremely important. Please note that this video is an obligatory rebuttal of the now-deprecated essay of the protagonist theory. New additions have been made to repair the functionally incomplete original, which delivered a flawed moral message. I cannot stress this enough. If you're going to listen to or read this essay, please see it through until the very end. I will not accept any feedback from readers or listeners who have not reviewed the essay in its entirety. If you have already listened to the original The Protagonist Theory, I highly recommend that you listen to this or skip to the timestamp in the video's description and listen to whatever is there. You may notice that this video is longer than the original. There is a reason for that. The original protagonist theory came before the Black Ops theory, which came before the antagonist theory. Warning, this video contains mentions of sex, violence, sexual harassment, and other uncomfortable or disturbing topics that you would expect when discussing inequity or world problems. This essay is a direct response to a calculated mistake I made in the creation of one of this video's predecessor, the protagonist theory, in addition to the antagonist theory, which partially served this purpose already. Also, this essay is shorter than the others. Without further ado, settle in and enjoy, if you can. Before I go any further, I must state formally that I am in fact a white heterosexual male native to the Northeastern United States. I am not and have not ever been anything but a male and most likely will stay that way. I have lived a relatively good life and don't have much to complain about. With that said, here we go. The Protagonist Theory, the revised version. This new adaptation of the essay is in two parts. The first is the original protagonist theory. The second is my rebuke. However, don't let that stop you from taking the original content seriously. None of this is a false narrative that you should simply dismiss. A lot of it is a flawed narrative that you should take with a grain of salt. I am a writer, a prolific one at that. I write fantasy, magical realism, some forms of sci-fi, and several other genres. It was only last year that I realized, after looking back on the writing I had, done in the past few months that I was, to my own dismay, a feminist. And I realized also that I might have been one the entire time. I must stress to the highest degree that I did not choose to be a feminist. It chose me. And it won't let me leave. In the end, being a feminist is a condition, not a philosophy. You experience literal symptoms that worsen the more and more you realize that it's the case. You have a harder and harder time enjoying a lot of things, namely media created before the 1980s. But in the end, I don't mind it. So back to the writer thing. One of the things that I've always thought about is what it means to be a protagonist. Now, here's what I believe. This isn't the exact dictionary definition of protagonist, but it's still technically true. The protagonist is the main character of the story. They are always or almost always in the spotlight. The protagonist is not always the hero. Sometimes, the protagonist and the antagonist are one in the same. We call that an antihero. The protagonist is with you all the way most of the time. There are three main types of stories, these being first person, second person, and third person. For our purposes, we will not be discussing the second person perspective. In a first person story, things are always from the protagonist's perspective, although, depending on the tense and format of the story, the reader can be allowed to know things that the protagonist doesn't yet know, especially if it is a past tense story. Some stories don't have protagonists, but most do. Some stories have multiple protagonists, an example being a piece of my childhood, the cartoon Wild Kratz, which centers around the two brothers, Martin and Chris. One thing that is almost entirely consistent is that, if the story is not from the protagonist's perspective, it will be within their horizons. A story follows the protagonist, like a kid following their parent through a crowded marketplace. Sometimes the kid will go to look at something and turn around to find the parent gone. But 
they will eventually find themselves back behind the parent, sometimes holding their hand, sometimes lagging behind. If I stand in a field in the sunset, I can see what is directly in front of me and the horizon. This doesn't mean I can see what's in between me and the horizon among the dark trees. The story focuses on everything between the protagonist and the horizon, even if the protagonist can't quite see it. The story tells about things that still concern the protagonist, not always what the protagonist knows. The protagonist is arguably the most important character in the story. There is no character in a story who is 100% safe from being killed off, but if anyone is most likely to survive, it's the protagonist. And if the protagonist does die, they're probably going to be the last major character to do so. This brings me to the topic of a deuteragonist. The deuteragonist is the second most important character in the story, such as the protagonist's best friend, sister, brother, or close cousin. In some stories, all three will survive. The protagonist and deuteragonist confront the antagonist and eventually come to an agreement in which the antagonist promises to change their ways for the better. Sometimes, nobody survives. The protagonist, deuteragonist, and antagonist are trapped in a building with a bomb set by the antagonist. The protagonist successfully kills the antagonist, but they and the deuteragonist are unable to escape the building before the bomb goes off. The most real thing to you in the world is yourself. It's the closest to you. If there is anything in a story that is closest to the reader's self, it's the protagonist, as if they are an avatar for the reader in the story's world. If worlds were to collide and the reader were to become one with a single person or thing in the story's world, it would be the protagonist by default. If you were to reach your finger past the page and into the story's world, it's likely that the first thing you would touch would be the protagonist's shoulder. The protagonist, no matter how much influence they have on the plot, is the center of the story. They are, by a more metaphorical interpretation, the reason the story can take form at all, the window from our world into the story. The protagonist could be responsible for moving the entire plot along, the true most important character in the story, or they could be not much more than a camera person, showing what's happening but having little more effect than the sound of their footsteps being present in the grass. Now, what does this have to do with feminism or anything of the sort? Well, we're focusing on one specific story. This story is ongoing and is still being written. It's the story of humanity. Before I say anything else, I am aware that there are technically more than two sexes and more than two genders. There is a whole spectrum of these things that have been discovered or introduced throughout the years. But for this purpose, we will be limited to the two biologically standard sexes, male and female. Secondly, I am aware that there are more than three roles in a story. There are many. But once again, we will be mostly limiting it to three. With all these uncertainties, we must set some ground rules. Although it is impossible to say exactly when humanity, Homo sapiens sapiens specifically, came into existence, we can assume it was about 200,000 years ago. Unless this document is lying in the rubble on a post-apocalyptic world, we can assume that humanity hasn't gone extinct yet. Whether we all die tomorrow night or we survive until the very moment the universe explodes into a fiery nova, we're going to be extinct someday. Rule number one. The story of humanity begins around the time that humanity, Homo sapiens sapiens, came into existence. And it ends when humanity goes extinct. Thus, it is still being written, and we have no way of knowing where the plot will go next. Here are the other rules. The story of humanity has three roles for its characters, protagonist, deuteragonist, and antagonist. The story only has two characters. Both of these characters can, will, could, and or have played the role of antagonist. Only one character can be the protagonist, and only one can be the deuteragonist. There can be only one protagonist. These two characters are woman and man. The real question we're trying to answer, with all of the meaning of the word protagonist in mind, is which character is the deuteragonist and which character is the protagonist. There is only one answer. Now, let's figure it out. First, we should look at the character of man. 
In the story so far, it would appear that almost every prominent achievement between the two characters has been achieved by man. Man was the first to fly beyond the speed of sound. Man has won all the great wars and fought all the most valiant battles. Man was the first to touch the stars and the first to see the bottom of the ocean. Man has toppled all of the evil world leaders and criminals. Man invented all of the world's most powerful weapons, the sword, the rifle, the crossbow, and the nuclear bomb. Man built most of the world's buildings, brick by brick. Man wrote all the world's greatest stories. Most of the world's greatest and strongest leaders have been men. Men have made all the biggest decisions. Man has always been the one to make history. This must mean that, without a doubt, man must be the protagonist, right? No, not at all, actually. In fact, there's some evidence to be found that some of the claims might entirely be false. There's a chance that man just wrote its own truth first in some cases. That's just what man wants you to think. All this really confirms is that man wants to be the protagonist the most. Not only that, but man has also made every measure to make woman look not just unfit, but useless. Look at all of the world's supposed greatest stories. The Greek myths, the Egyptian legends, the medieval stories of old. All of them have male protagonists. In the stories of old, we have Odysseus, Achilles, King Arthur, Macbeth, Hercules, Robin Hood, and the countless knights in shining armor. We have the movies and comic books of the 20th century, Rambo, Indiana Jones, James Bond, Superman, Iron Man, The Hulk, Luke Skywalker, and finally, the video games of the 1990s and the 21st century, Duke Nukem, Master Chief, Link, the Doomslayer. All of them have been men. But not just that, they're all big, muscular men, military leaders, kings, thanes, soldiers, and mercenaries. And in all of these narratives, women are depicted as helpless damsels in distress, princesses and maidens and whatnot who just scream and cry and whine. And worse yet, if you do come across a female protagonist, it's probably going to be in an adult narrative. Almost all stories for preteens and young adults have male protagonists, not even giving kids a chance to accept the idea of a female hero. Man hasn't just stated how good it is, it has also literally walked right up to the author and told them, explicitly, that it should be. Man has proclaimed itself to be the perfect protagonist. But what I'm about to do is dissect man's claim. We'll see how it holds up to one simple attack. Once I'm done, we'll see who's the real damsel in distress. Man wants the author to believe that woman not only didn't and won't do great things, but that it can't do great things, that it is somehow too small, weak, frail, or stupid. Before I say anything else, I must say that I simply hate the Greek legends in their entirety. They're boring, poorly written, and just about big, strong men going on dumb adventures, stabbing monsters, making out with witches, and whenever they actually don't know what to do, one of the gods throws a magic lightning bolt to fix everything. And the protagonists often just kill random people for no reason whatsoever. Greek myths are so old-fashioned that they make the first season of Star Trek look about as woke as a pride parade. Now, let's say we have a big, strong, muscly military man. He wakes up in the morning, has a lavish breakfast, says hello to his son, and goes to the range to flex his muscles and shoot some targets with his big, muscly machine gun. He is skilled and perfectly accurate, always hitting bullseyes. The military man then goes to the battlefield, dodging shells and shooting people left and right, being brave and sweating his butt off. He gets slightly wounded, goes back to the tent to get treatment, and returns to battle. After a great victory against the enemy, the military man goes back to the capital to have a party in his newly tailored suit, before going home to have dinner, a shower, and then going to bed. Now, if you think about it on the surface, the military man seems to be strong, self-sufficient, and skilled. He doesn't need help from anyone. If he did get help, he wouldn't be as manly. But then you start to wonder, who made the military man breakfast? Who takes care of his son? Who irons his clothing? Who cleaned out his gun? Who treated his wounds? Who tailored his suit? Who cleaned the floor of the Capitol building where the party was held? 
Who cooked his dinner? Who did the dishes afterwards? Who made his bed? Who cleaned his sheets? And most important of all, who brought him into the world in the first place and tirelessly worked to feed him and raise him to be as strong as he is? Who does and has done all of these things for every strong military man in the world? That's right, a woman. If it weren't for women, none of these things would be possible. Women are the reason the human race exists at all, in the most literal sense possible. Technically, women invented men. And what did that military man really accomplish anyway? I know several people personally who would disagree with me on this, but in the end you can't deny that war is pointless. Speaking of Star Trek, you could have less empathy than Mr. Spock's dad, and you'd still probably be able to figure out the objective, mathematical fact that war is a concept and as a practice is ridiculous. It's a waste of human life, resources, time, and energy. Even if you don't have a shred of emotional capacity, you can agree that war functionally makes no sense. I am aware that there are female soldiers nowadays, and I'm not exactly against that, but that's a different discussion, and that it is possible for a female leader to start a war, but let's be honest. There's likely been over 5,000 wars in human history. And how many were started by women? About 10. And furthermore, even though there are female criminals, female murderers, female kidnappers, female terrorists, female mass shooters, and even female rapists, the majority of lawbreakers and bad guys are, statistically speaking, men. Women are not smarter than men. They never were. They're just less dumb. Men are simple creatures. They listen to their stomach and their you-know-what and nothing else. Maurice Minifield from Northern Exposure said it himself. Woman, as a character, is always the underdog. And the best protagonists are underdogs. Woman has always worked against the odds in every single turn the story's plot has thrown at it. While man beat itself up and called it honor, woman worked in the background, getting the real work done. Woman was almost, emphasis on the almost, always the righteous one. It knew when to start, and it knew when to stop. Whenever man fell, woman helped it up. Now, there are select cases in select chapters of the story where woman became the antagonist. This is very true, but the point still stands. Woman worked against odds that it could not control and persevered. And eventually, only in the last few chapters did woman get its catharsis moment, rising up and finally fighting for what it wanted. And man gave it nothing in return. In the end, all man did was create pointless new challenges for woman to either endure or overcome. And most of the time, woman was still up to the challenge. I'm very sorry to say this to myself and my fellow males. We were never the main character. We were never the center of the story. No matter how much we tried, it's only now that we find that the author had the truth planned along. We're just the sorry deuteragonists, the sidekicks, always just to the side of the center. Important, but not the most important. A main character, but not the main character. Women are the real protagonists. They always were, and they always will be. But that's not even the worst part. Women still need men, right? There needs to be a male and a female to produce offspring. And in the short term, yes, this is true. Without men, humanity would go extinct. But in the long term, it's not that simple. There is a species of reptile in the deserts of Arizona known as a desert grassland whiptail lizard, Aspidocilus uniparens. They aren't very remarkable at first glance. Each whiptail lizard is about six inches long, striped, and has long, thin fingers. They are fast insect eaters, which mostly mind their own business. They seem just like a generic lizard, except one thing sets them apart. Every single desert grassland whiptail lizard is a female. There is not a single man among them. These creatures are capable of producing eggs all on their own without the need for a mate. This is known as parthenogenesis, common among some species of reptiles. And the scariest part is, there probably were, at one point, males of the species. But then, once parthenogenesis came into play as a mutation, there was no need for males. They all died off. And soon, there were none left. Humans are animals. 
It is biologically impossible for an animal species to survive with only male individuals. But as the whiptail lizard has proved, it is evolutionarily possible for a species to survive with only females. It is extremely unlikely, especially for mammals like us, but it is possible. We might be screwed. There could come a time where we're no longer needed. And we can already read the writing on the wall. With all the war, rape, harassment, and general idiocy we men frankly love to cause. We're asking for it. Now, it's time we revealed the author. Mother Nature is the author of our story, and she knows full well that between the two characters, she'd rather kill off man. Mother Nature could make parthenogenesis a plot device. Mother Nature knows how it feels to be a mother, so she knows where heroism really lies. Just like any story, movie, video game, or play, the story of humanity is made in scenes. And there's nothing stopping Mother Nature from, given a few thousand more years of writing, to create a scene like the following. The two characters are walking along the edge of a cliff. Man looks to the side, temporarily distracted. Woman takes the opportunity and shoves man off the cliff. Man clings to the edge and begs woman to pull it back up. A wicked smile crosses woman's face. And then, woman undoes man's grip, causing it to fall to its death, uttering the words, Long live the queen. Hold on a second. Don't log off just yet. This is the point where the original video would have ended. But we're not done yet. We're only almost done. I'd be pretty concerned if you didn't see a flaw in any of this. The theory so far regards females as being superior. Admittedly, this is a pretty new concept. Throughout history, men have been regarded as the superior sex. But as I've been trying to prove with these various video essays over the past month, this makes literally no sense. So, if men aren't superior, women must be superior then, right? That's a trick question. Hear me out here. A common misconception is that a solution to bigotry is regarding the downtrodden as superior. This is undeniably false. If we truly want to create a more equitable world, turning the tables and regarding minorities as the superior is not nearly the way to do it. That's not progress, and here's why. As I did in the Black Ops theory, I'm going to use some lore from Edge of Elsewhere, my conceptual piece of alternate reality fiction. This piece may or may not appear in the actual final story like the last one, but it is still part of the lore, albeit unfinished. This is a passage describing the Republic of Catalani, one of the four fictional countries in the edge of elsewhere lore. Remember, this is not a real country. The Republic of Catalani. Written by Swedish ethno-historian Amaryllis Anderberg on May 19, 2812. Description, North America's fourth country, the Republic of Catalani is over 500 miles from the coast of central California on the tropical island of Catalani. It is considered to be a first world country, but is relatively poor compared to other first world countries. The island of Catalini is one of the two land masses on planet Earth confirmed to be under the influence of a supernatural being, seemingly a much weaker version of the invisible entity that protects Stalina. The would-be Republic of Catalani was first colonized by humans at some point before 4000 BCE, and was probably united to be one civilization at some point between 2900 and 3200 BCE. It is unknown how the island of Catalani was originally settled. Its people appear very similar to those in Hawaii and the Philippines, often having black or brown hair. Although Stalina is known for having adopted what we would consider progressive ideals as early as the medieval, times, the Republic of Catalani, known as Catalani up until the year 2007 when it became a democracy, has been literally built on progressive philosophies such as environmentalism, some form of social equity, feminism, fair criminal trial, and free speech, to an extent that is completely unheard of in any civilization before the 1400s, although this is arguable for various reasons. This is due to the Catalanian religion, known as the Catalania cult, which is the worship of Mother Nature herself through the magical powers granted to some of its people by the being that protects Catalani itself. Nature is referred to mostly as the Mother Goddess. 
This and other factors make the Catalani occult eerily similar to both European Druidic religions and the famous, or infamous, old religion seen in Arthurian legend. Catalanians believe that the mother goddess is the mother of all things, and, by that alone, she and all those like her should be respected fundamentally. Those like her, of course, meaning women. For over 3.5 thousand years, religious, governmental, and even military roles in Catalani were filled mostly by women. Up until the year 1850, the act of rape was punishable by public humiliation followed by public execution. Rape is still a serious crime to this day and is still punished by public humiliation and various other extremely serious punishments. On average, over the past 2,500 years, 60% of Catalanian soldiers have consistently been women, including the highly skilled religious warriors known as the Catalanian. Fighting witches, a type of military sorcerer. Catalani didn't believe that men were physically unfit for battle, but instead believed that men were untrustworthy and less capable of following orders or working as a team, a philosophy that is highly controversial. To this day, men still are not allowed to serve as generals or commanders and are restricted to the private, squad leader, and major ranks. 90% of drill sergeants and recruiters for the Catalanian military are also female. Also, out of the several thousand years Catalani has existed, Catalani has only been governed by a male leader for two, in which a Catalanian queen temporarily allowed her brother to serve as monarch while she was ill, as she trusted him over any of her sisters who would otherwise be the right choice. As a democracy, none of the male candidates who have run have gotten more than 15% of the vote. Men are not allowed to serve any of the higher positions as religious leaders, many who are not versed in the country's culture. Believe that men are treated poorly in Catalani, but this is far from the case. In Catalani, fatherhood is viewed as a sacred practice. In most parts of society, men are treated almost equally to women, especially in the modern day, with the exception of religious roles. Catalani occult has many reasons that males should be valued. Despite having had a gender philosophy that is arguably much more reasonable than any other country, many scholars agree that the Republic of Catalini's pro-woman societal structure is not nearly a prime example of social equity, and is in fact far from it, as, despite being built on respect, Catalani's society is still technically very unequal, even if it is in favor of women instead of men. Stalina is often regarded as being the most consistently progressive nation throughout the history of the past 4,000 years, thanks to Catalani's refusal to trust males with positions of power. Although many feminists view the Republic of Catalani as some form of utopia, it can't be denied that it is definitely not. Even though, by the standards of the pre-common era times, it was the most equitable. Although the Catalanian government is good to its people, Catalani's foreign policy is characteristically shaky. There have been many stories of Pacific sailors dating back as early as the 1600s in which lost sailors have landed their vessel on Catalani only to be immediately arrested at gunpoint by squads of Catalanian soldiers who patrol the shores constantly. Aided by snipers stationed in the treeline at all times, stories which continue to come up even now. Just like Stalina, Catalani's magic is capable of defending the island from human attackers without help from its human soldiers, which is likely the main reason that Catalani was able to remain as it is for so long. Yet, the Catalanians are very wary of uninvited outsiders. The national language of the Republic of Catalani is Catalani, but English is a common second language there do though. Country's proximity to the U.S. Catalani is a beautiful tropical wilderness for anyone on the good side of its inhabitants to enjoy. Just like Stalina, magic and mystery lurks all around the island and its waters, so chances are you won't encounter many other tourists if you dare to travel there. So, do you think that the Republic of Catalani is a utopia? Cause I don't. That's not equality. Even though it's way better for women to be in charge than for men to be in charge for a lot of reasons, it's still not equality or equity. The story of humanity is a narrative. And in most interpretations of that narrative, women would logically be the protagonists. But in a way, that might not matter. The story of humanity is no longer the narrative we need to focus on. 
In the here and now in this world, the story we're really living is a success story, a story of a good fight, a fight not fueled by testosterone or greed like all those before it. This is the story of making a better world. Not everyone is the protagonist of the story, don't get me wrong. But what's important is that being a man or being a woman doesn't make you the protagonist. Many women and many men alike are the true protagonists of the story, and, just the same, many women and many men are the antagonists. There's one thing that matters that determines who you are in this story. It's not estrogen, and it is certainly not testosterone. It's not sex, not gender, not class, and not race. In fact, in some cases, you don't necessarily have to be human. What makes you the hero in the story is if you feed the flame, if the fire burns in your heart. In many cases, you don't have to even know that you're doing the right thing, and you're still the hero. All you have to do is have empathy, be righteous. Whether you're a nurse, saving lives and healing the wronged and the sick, or a soldier, picking up a rifle and fighting against those who side with evil. Even if you're just doing your part with something as little as picking up some trash from the beach. You don't have to know you've got the fire to burn brighter than a star. For example, I'm doing my part by telling you this. Every person, female or male, who watches this video and gets the right idea from it has caught it. Like two candles, when I light your wick, I lose none of my flame. In the process, a truly good act benefits the actor as well, as, in the end, generosity has no price. I don't care who you are. I don't care how old you are, where you're from, or if you're a woman or a man. Whether it's conscious or unconscious, if you have the drive to make change for the better in the world, you're on fire. You are the real protagonist. Now get out there and take our story back.